Welcome to our first in a series of e-learning opportunities sponsored by Lees and Associates. We are a cemetery planning and design firm. As far as we know, we're the largest firm of our kind in uh, North America that uh, concentrates, specializes in all aspects of cemetery planning and design. Uh, more information, of course, is available on our website uh, www.elac.ca. Uh, I'm joined today by Rebecca Anderson, one of our most capable associates uh, with a cast of uh, several others, uh, many of whom are pictured here in, um, in, this, uh, in this photograph. Um, this is the first in a series. Uh, our intention is to uh, produce another series uh, or another uh, a number of webinars. Many of you have contributed to a survey that uh, that we sent out that uh, uh, provided us with valuable information. And our, our sense is that uh, Green Barrel and Cemetery Master Planning are top of the list for you. But uh, we're looking for more feedback arising from today's uh, from today's webinar. Um, this is uh, an, a new service, a new product that we are. Um, producing and we look forward to and in fact we need your your input um, the first thing you told us was that the cemetery trends is something you're interested in so that will be our focus today so, uh, social environmental and economic trends uh, uh, green burial and potential burial surge will also be uh, part of um, of what we're talking about and your feedback is absolutely essential. I can't emphasize that enough in this uh, first go round. Um, most of you, there we've over 30 participants today, which we're really pleased with, um, um, have a lot of information. Um, you're doing a lot of innovative things and we'd like to uh, be able to feed that back to this, uh, this wonderful uh, bereavement sector uh, community that we uh, are all uh, very much a part of. Social trends. I'll talk about artfulness, passive recreation, and diversity. This is a, a, one of my, my favorite examples of how artfulness equals connectedness. Uh, a giant rock, I don't know how many tons this thing would be at a cemetery in Copenhagen. I was there a number of years ago. These three boys came screaming up in their bikes, jumped on this rock. They obviously knew it was on a fulcrum. They went to one side, it rocked over about 10 inches. They went to the other side. Did that a couple times, rocked back and forth. And off they sped. And I thought, you know, this is a generation of kids that's, that's dialed in and their families are connected to this cemetery. Um, a playful, uh, fixed type of art, uh, dynamic art. Um, there are many other types of ephemeral art. Um, this one, sort of semi-ephemeral, another one of our favorites in Kenora. Um, this is actually a fundraising opportunity for Kenora City Cemeteries where they create these ice candles starting in November. Um, then around Christmas Eve, they roll them out. Um, and uh, over 5,000 of them now over the Christmas period, lineups of, uh, of cars to get into the cemetery to see the spectacle. Um, and it's raising a lot of money for the, uh, for the cemetery. It's, it's an artful way of connecting with the community. And we're seeing more and more, these are just a few examples, folks, of, of the different ways that um, cemeterians are connecting with their community. Sure, it's marketing, um, but it's also, there's some, some, some uh, playfulness to it. Um, and there's some real personal uh, connections that occur. Um, another great example, uh, this is an event-based uh, uh, art. Uh, performance art, if you will, um, at the Night for All Souls, led by Glenn Hodges and Paula Jardine at Mount View Cemetery in Vancouver, BC. Uh, it's going on now into, oh gosh, it's got to be at least 15 years. Thousands of people will show up in the last uh, weekend before uh, uh, the end of October, loosely based on the Day of the Dead um, tradition, uh, now very much a, a Vancouver tradition uh, that, again, connects families in a respectful way. It's sure it's whimsical. It's very much art. Uh, but it's all about connection. And these are the families that will continue to use our services, use our cemeteries um, in, um, in, in meaningful ways. 
Passive recreation, good people doing good things. That's a phrase from the crime prevention through environmental design, but it really transfers over wonderfully into how we manage and program our cemeteries. We're seeing more and more of this. And I would guess that most of you with us today can think of examples in the recent months where more and more people are using the cemeteries as places of respite, of contemplation, uh, maybe even uh, passive recreation like a picnic, certainly walking, uh, bird watching, uh, good people doing good things, um, walking kids to school, skiing through the cemetery in the winter. Um, we have many pictures of other somewhat more active uh, uh, recreation. Um, I don't think any of us would agree that uh, a frisbee or uh, kicking a soccer ball it would be appropriate in a cemetery. And we always have to be respectful of the prime purpose of the cemetery as a place of grieving and, and, and burial. But passive recreation is, uh, is one of many ways cemeteries are connecting uh, with the community. Diversity is strength, diversity is equity. This is an example here, uh, Royal Oak Burial Park, one of the first cemeteries in Western Canada to create a Muslim burial area. Um, and another one in uh, Fort McMurray, um, this is what's known as a Qibla stone. Um, those familiar with the Muslim faith will know that there is a Qibla stone in, in Mecca, Saudi Arabia. Uh, the orientation to Mecca is an interesting one. I've got a, a diagram to the right that shows that the over the pole route is the appropriate uh, orientation for cemetery Muslim graves and, and for prayer, of course. One of maybe the classic example here in Canada recently of a, of a trend to ensure that diversity is part of the strength of the cemetery. Um, if you're not seeing this yet in your communities, you will be seeing it soon. A couple more examples here. I thought a wonderful one in Kamloops where um, a heritage cemetery where a lot of uh, uh, Chinese Canadians were, were buried. Um, they fortunately had the records and they were able to recreate these wooden headstones. And I thought it was very smart. They did two copies of them. So when these um, deteriorate, they they've got another generation of markers set to go. Uh, the example on the right is the uh, ceremonial area at, in a Cali, um, the uh, burial ground there. All of these, I think you'll, you'll agree, reflect the place. And I think that that's one of the trends that we're seeing a lot in our work and a lot of the work that many of you are doing is the cemeteries reflect the place, not only in the narrative that is, uh, that is literally writ there in, in stone, but the ways in which the uh, burial grounds are, are designed. Another great example is uh, the way in which First Nations uh, cemeteries are, are, um, have traditionally uh, evolved. Um, and, and I think uh, that one of the trends we're seeing is a loosening up of uh, what can happen in and around a cemetery in order to accommodate whether it's Muslim burial, First Nations burial, um, or any one of a number of other um, aspects of um, uh, burial traditions in, in our cemeteries. Talk a moment about, uh, for, uh, for a couple of moments, about environmental trends. Um, the importance of cemetery and the overall fabric of open space in the system. Um, cemeteries will be urban, habitat oases, um, if they are not already. And our urban forests depend on our cemeteries. Um, these are uh, uh, just a few of the uh, environmental benefits of, um, of, of, of cemeteries as keystones of the uh, open space system in, in our cities. This is just one example, of course, uh, speaking to you uh, from Vancouver, BC. It's one of my favorite examples. It shows quite clearly how Mountain View Cemetery is central to the open space fabric of the community. Uh, it's wonderfully connected with a, a greenway right through the middle. Um, um, and although uh, managers there will tell you there are challenges with the with the cemetery as becoming a de facto park. And back to what I said a moment ago, we need to keep the focus on this as a place of mourning and remembrance. Um, but nonetheless, um, uh, right next to, in this case, Queen Elizabeth Park and other smaller parks in the, in the neighborhood, um, central to both habitat and, um, 
and uh, community use. Uh, another good example from, from uh, Montreal, um, Mont Royal Cemetery is uh, maybe the most important keystone landscape within the city. Um, and, and connects with uh, at least five or six neighborhoods, including uh, very close to the downtown area. Um, this one, Montparnasse in, in a cemetery in Paris, and, and the next example, uh, I think, are, are great examples of how in a very gray uh, urban setting, cemeteries are so important for their, uh, the multiple benefits associated with, uh, with, the, with the open space system and, um, and the greenery. Um, so why do we bring this up? Uh, yes, these are, are older historic established cemeteries, but keep in mind um, Mount, Mount View Cemetery in Vancouver, for example, was years ago way out on the perimeter of the city. Um, we are now looking in many communities at establishing and at least acquiring land uh, for cemetery purposes that is now on the edge of urban containment zones, but in the future, and cemeteries is one of those planning uses that we, uh, land uses that we need to plan for long into the future, those cemeteries will be keystones of the new neighborhoods within those new communities. And so that's uh, that, you know, part of what we're trying to get across here is the, the trend towards, yes, looking way ahead, but also understanding the role of cemeteries uh, as, a, uh, as a keystone within the, uh, within the park system and the overall open space fabric of, uh, of the community. Cemeteries are also wonderful urban habitat oases. Uh, songbirds, of course, uh, for one, but in many cemeteries, especially where there's a little bit of undeveloped land, there are, or near a um, near water course, um, the flora and fauna associated with cemeteries uh, and the, the biodiversity associated with cemeteries is, is really very impressive. Um, and we have a, a wonderful opportunity with this trend to work closely with um, our counterparts in planning and parks and, and engineering to ensure that the cemeteries are as productive a, a, a landscape from a biodiversity standpoint as they possibly can be. We'll touch on Green Barrel in a minute, which is maybe one of the better examples of it, but um, we, we see so often now uh, cemeteries with, uh, with apiaries, with beehives. Um, and I know that many of you on the call have apiaries. I apologize if, um, if, uh, if I don't have those pictures uh, uh, with, with us today, um, uh, but this is a, a classic one from, from Greenwood. Um, a wonderful way to teach about uh, the, the incredible value of pollinators, to create pollination gardens, and to again, use education and connection with the community to, um, uh, to ensure that families uh, really are, are making best use of that land and, and the experience and, and different programs that can happen there. The urban forests are, and, and will continue to be a central part of our various mitigation measures for uh, climate change. Um, the importance of carbon sequestration, uh, trapping particulate matter, which is uh, a lot of people don't understand how many thousand little bits of dust that get trapped in the leaves of trees, uh, very important in cemeteries. And of course, uh, minimizing the heat island effect. Um, Brookside Cemetery in Winnipeg is a, is a wonderful example of this. It's one of the few locations in a city where trees can grow to their maturity. Um, and I think many of you would agree, uh, based on your experience, that um, this is uh, not only a, a wonderful arboricultural or horticultural uh, asset, but um, it adds to the beauty, um, the sense of permanence, um, and the experience of the cemetery as a whole. Um, Hillside Cemetery in, uh, in Medicine Hat, I think, is a, is a wonderful example of what I just said. It's so clear that um, in, a, in a landscape that is otherwise devoid of canopy, look at these trees and you can just imagine the oases that this is creating uh, and the habitat that's uh, available there. Um, and in the understory, the, the range of different um, 
uh, species that can grow and um, and animals that uh, that can flourish there. Not to mention the fact that it's a, it's a it's a respite from the wind and the sun in the in the summertime. I'm hitting the tops of the waves here, folks. These are trends, um, and I, I hope we'll have an, enough time to answer most of your questions later. Um, we'll dive deeper into some of these in in, in later um, webinars. Um, so apologize if I'm uh, moving along maybe a, a little more quickly than we might in an otherwise one and a half or two hour session. Economic trends that we're seeing, um, and these are just three of the, the high points, are a real move towards cost recovery or better. Um, the imperative of, a, of perpetual care, sufficiency of the perpetual care fund, and the old axiom, not as a business, but business-like. So by way of, dis, of illustrating that, um, we'd like to see every cemetery move towards cost recovery or better. Uh, I think most of you would agree with that. Um, although I think it's important to emphasize, especially with the audience we have today, that uh, many councils are very comfortable with subsidizing cemeteries through the tax base revenue, uh, which is entirely legitimate. Um, municipal government offers uh, cradle to grave services right from daycare and recreation programs all the way through to cemeteries. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a legitimate uh, tax-based expenditure. I think we would all agree. Um, but of course, uh, the cost of, of maintaining the cemetery in perpetuity, which is a long time, um, needs to be uh, taken into account and and recovered. And if many of the things that we've just been talking about are to come to pass, the viability of our cemeteries from a financial standpoint are necessary. Um, so not every cemetery has the uh, has the ability, or even for that matter, the management tools um, to uh, really move towards cost recovery. Um, uh, at least quickly. Um, and by management tools, what I mean by that is a lot of the data is all kind of jumbled up. Um, many cemeteries are managed with data that, that come largely through the parks and the engineering side, and it's not well suited to running a business um, or being business-like. Um, so that's one of the challenges in, in moving towards um, cost recovery, um, but also a, a, a full understanding of of where your price points are at, uh, ensuring that there is uh, a wide range of, um, of services, both memorialization and interment services, um, that uh, that that move you towards towards cost recovery, um, and at the same time address those at the um, uh, at the full range of socioeconomic uh, capacity. We don't want to leave ever leave behind. Um, those that uh, cannot afford um, the more expensive options. The perpetual care imperative is something that, that we're seeing more and more as a trend and that will affect your cemeteries, frankly, should affect your cemeteries and the way you manage them in the coming years. It takes a lot of principle in this age of very low interest rates to be able to generate sufficient interest to pay for the maintenance. Um, so for example, in this uh, uh, graph, we're seeing by 2045, we think that the interest income will cover the maintenance costs. Um, that's, a, that's a fair ways out. We're pretty comfortable with that kind of uh, time frame, but for many of you, it is going to be 30, 40, 50, 60 years. And so um, developing models, uh, uh, taking advantage of some of the models that uh, some of us have developed to look forward and recalibrate those every 10 years or so when as your um, as your funds increase and as interest rates change as your frankly as your your maintenance costs change and your understanding of what maintenance in an inactive cemetery will look like um, because that's the key I don't know how many cemeteries uh, that I'm aware of in North America that are at or near the inactive stage. And of course, what that means is that uh, the last grave has been, has been filled. Um, the last interment has occurred. But 
actually the last sale probably goes back a, a generation, 20, 25, even 30 years. Uh, I know many of you on the call today are burying people who bought graves 30 and 40 years ago. So what this really means is that the operating revenue associated with those sales stopped long ago, but you still have to maintain that cemetery to a standard acceptable to the families that have recently buried. It's one thing to think about families that were buried 100 years ago. They may tolerate a, a, a lower standard, uh, but uh, those families that were, were buried there recently are expecting the same high standards, and fair enough, as they should. So there's, there's quite an interesting uh, actuarial and, and uh, projection uh, challenge that we have in determining what is sufficient perpetual care. The key message here is it's something that if you're not faced with it now, you will be soon, so you should be ready. I mentioned not as a business, but business-like, and I'm sure many of you have been uh, asked by your council and your boards, we, we want this thing to be run in, in, as a business, um, but they don't give you either the resources, <laughs> financial or, or, or uh, human resources, and they don't give you the data, they don't give you the tools, um, and so you're left with antiquated uh, systems to run it as a business. You're left with minimal or no marketing uh, budgets, which of course for any business is absolutely imperative. Um, but you can run the cemetery uh, in a business-like fashion. I would actually argue that running any public service as a business is a commodification of what should be a public good. We don't run our rec centers or our fire halls or our sewer departments as a business but we can certainly run those and cemeteries in a more business-like way. And so um, that's why the financial planning and the factors that I, elements that I, I mentioned a moment ago around cost recovery and perpetual care are so important. And the, the, the systems related to those um, are, are, are so important. And, and, and why the discussion with your senior management and council is, is, is also imperative. So we're gonna pause here. We've got a few questions that uh, some of you um, uh, brought up um, either before the session um, and um, others have brought up this morning. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that we can look at each other a, a little bit better. Um, Rebecca, do you want to? Um... Sure. Um, thanks for that, Eric. I learned a lot in that first segment. So we've got a lot of interesting questions coming in. The one that we had up on the screen, we actually received uh, by email before. So they would like to know, in recent years, we've seen approximately 25% full burials and 75% cremation interments. Uh, with baby boomers passing away, I'm wondering if you feel we're gonna see an increase in the surge of full burials. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it came from uh, Heather Barr in, in, in uh, Maple Ridge. Um, I don't know that we're gonna see a surge. I do think that there will be an increase. Um, uh, not just because of the baby boomers, let's face it, um, that is the um, key demographic driver. Um, we'll talk about pandemics in a few moments, but the, the aging out of the baby boomers, uh, somewhere between seven and 10 million Canadians and 75 to 85 million Americans are going to die in the next 20 to 25 years. We're just starting to see the tip of that iceberg now. Um, so by that very fact alone, we will see more burials. Will the baby boomers be choosing more environmentally uh, conscious uh, disposition options uh, and burial options? Um, I think uh, green burial uh, is, is testament to, to that trend. Um, I think that as uh, fossil fuels and any taxes, any carbon taxes associated with cremation come on, people will take another look at, um, um, at, at, at traditional burial. And I think the next question actually is, it, it, it ties into the same one. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, so the next question we have here, we also received um, over email. So they were wondering what the status of short term at least on a right of internment is um, and what your opinion on whether or not cemeteries are supportive of this concept. Yeah. And listen, folks, if you're not hearing us, OK, just drop us a note in the in the chat. Um, but the question was, uh, uh, what is the response to the idea of short term or fixed term leases uh, of burial grounds? Um, so far at this point, um, uh, Quebec uh, offers fixed term leases, but they're long, they're 99 years. Um, Vancouver, on the other hand, have recently passed a bylaw December of last year that are about to allow and codify what has been the practice of reusing graves after 40 years, um, which has really meant that that cemetery is one of the very few in Canada that should be able to sustain burials generation over generation um, through the reuse process. So um, my sense and having worked with, uh, with uh, key opinion leaders such as many of you uh, over the years is that indeed uh, fixed term leases, short term leases as a questioner asked, uh, will become part of um, our toolkit of our, our planning and um, uh, capacity management. Um, there will be, uh, I think we would all agree, pushback people will be concerned about their grave being used without permission. I don't think any of us are suggesting that. Vancouver is certainly not suggesting that. So this is on a, on a go forward basis from here on out. Can graves uh, be purchased with the um, uh, understood intention of them being used um, um, multiple times over the generations and multiple uh, uh, individuals, maybe even strangers, being occupying the same column of of, um, of space. Uh, would you like to add, answer any more questions right now, or do you want to save those for the end? Yeah, we got we got time for at least one more. I think here, Rebecca. Um, okay, this one is somewhat related. If you want to go into the burial search topic at all, um, so we have a panel or a attendee asking. Um, with such uncertain times, what are some specific ways to conduct services in cemeteries? Uh, okay, you know what, I am going to let that one go until after the pandemic sure. question, but if there is one that's, uh, that's more appropriate to what we've talked about, I think that would be, uh, that would be um, good. So there's a question about ground pen penetrating radar, GPR. Um, they're wondering if you see a lot of this um, in your field or if there's leaders in this field? Ground penetrating radar is a useful tool in certain circumstances. There is not a geoscientist out there and it should be managed by someone that understands the science of soils and the technology. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't a geoscientist out there that can say with 100% accuracy that a grave is occupied or not occupied. Mm -hmm. So in certain circumstances where um, the, the plan necessitates some infill and it looks like there's a, 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 an entire area that for one reason the records do not show is occupied, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. If there is a pathway or a road or some other infrastructure going through or near the cemetery, GPR makes sense. Mm -hmm. But given the lack of absolute certainty that remains will not be encountered. There's almost always other ways of optimizing, if not maximizing the use of the cemetery land for burial purposes um, without relying on, you know, the 70, 80% good day accuracy of GPR. There are people, however, and we happy to um, uh, connect uh, uh, participant with, uh, with those specialists, it should be done on a regional, if not a local basis, because of the, the uh, different soil types, moisture types, and so on um, in, in, in each locale. Great. Good question, thank you for that. Uh, we have a couple here related to um, the cemetery business planning section, if you would like to address any of those. Yes. 
Um, so we have a question, uh, does the changing expect expectation for shorter payback in a business model explain the lack of cemetery space in North America? Just repeat that last sentence, please, Rebecca. Um, so they're asking if the shorter payback in a business model explains the lack of cemetery space in North America. That's a good question. I, I don't think it does. Um, I mean, the, the, the payback for cemeteries is actually very good, um, also known as the return on investment or the ROI. Um, um, depending on the marketing, the profile, the connectedness to the cemetery. Um, uh, uh, Colin Berry, for example, uh, the, the return on investment there is often well within the five to seven year period that any banker would lend you money on. Mm -hmm. um, the return on investment on traditional burial ground is, is another story. Uh, and it's difficult, isn't it? Because real estate is expensive. Um, but I did uh, a back of the envelope uh, study for a cemetery I'm very familiar with, uh, looking at the adjacent residential lots mm -hmm. and the return on investment buying those lots at real retail real estate rates did pay off. Yes, paid off a bit longer, but hopefully um, municipalities have, you know, they're, 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 they've been around for a while and they're, they're good for a while. Um, but it's, it's, uh, I, I don't think it, it has had a significant uh, uh, impact on how the, the crisis of cemetery lands, uh, the cemetery land capacity really. Right. Uh, maybe I'll pose one more question to you before we move on. Sure. Um, so this uh, participant would like to know, in terms of financial viability, have you seen much difference between cemetery management in different sized communities? Yes. Um, communities under 10 to 15,000 have a more difficult time, especially unionized communities to recover all their costs. Uh, two reasons, uh, the, the primary reason I'll just say is uh, the volume is just not there to um, the, for operating revenue. There's only a couple dozen burials a year, um, burials a year. There's probably many more um, interment of cremated remains, um, but those generally yield a little bit less. And so the operating revenue, it, it, it's, it's more difficult to square that with operating expenses. At the end of the day, most places in North America, we need to cut the grass basically from April to October. Right. Um, some places a little bit shorter, but that's a long time, especially if we're paying a livable wage. So mm -hmm. um, that, that can be difficult. Communities um, in the 20 to 50,000 range should be able to recover their costs and certain communities greater than that. That's assuming that the cemetery is capturing most of those families that are choosing in-ground burial. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, on a good day, most municipal cemeteries are only bringing in 20% of those families that choose cremation. Um, so that's where the potential lies for all of us, and hence the importance of cremation gardens and, um, and, and, and also a, a green burial, because we're finding, maybe not surprisingly, that families that choose green burial are coming over from uh, having previously thought they would be cremated because they thought it was a softer touch um, mm -hmm. environmentally. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that, that um, that's, that's, that's probably sufficient for that question mm -hmm. for now, but it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Eric, and thanks everyone for your questions. Continue to send them in in the question and answer section. Couple minutes now on green burial. Many of you in our first uh, reach out um, wanted to know more about this. Um, I'll hit the high points here. Um, and this is certainly one that we intend to dive deeper in in, in future e-learning opportunities. The five primary principles of green burial are no embalming. Um, and this is uh, twofold uh, for this reason. Many people don't think that embalming is, is necessary, uh, except in those circumstances where the 
the uh, there's been some trauma to the body, uh, or the, um, the the funeral or the burial will be delayed for some time. But I know we have a participant here today from Nairobi um, in Kenya, um, and embalming is not the tradition there, and they wait a good long time before <laughs> before the uh, burial occurs and before the funeral happens. So there are are ways of keeping the body cool even in warm climates. Um, um, so the, one of the principles, no involvement. Second principle, direct earth burial. So this this is really goes back to green burial is is a countryside burial. Green burial is really akin to a Muslim or a Jewish burial, uh, where in those traditions, contact of the body with the earth is uh, is 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 an expected uh, part of the of the burial process. But most importantly. Um, Direct earth burial means that um, um, energy rich concrete is not used to, uh, for a vault or to line the, uh, the grave opening. A biodegradable casket or shroud is, is expected to get, of course, back to the direct earth uh, uh, aspect and also to minimize the impact on um, hardwoods and potentially endangered uh, tree species for the creation of, of expensive caskets. Um, and of course, the air transport of those same caskets to uh, to uh, the, the the cemetery. Green burial involves some aspect of ecological restoration, um, controlling invasive species baseline, um, some aspect of habitat enhancement, normally some aspect of restoring the indigenous ecosystem um, to its more or less productive capacity. So in, um, in Victoria, BC, that would be a Gary Oak rainforest type of condition. Uh, in Lethbridge, it may be prairie grasses. Um, in, uh, in Nunavut, it may be um, reestablishing uh, re the tundra. Um, so it's different in every ecosystem as, as it should be. And then communal mem memorialization, such as the one shown on the right. And the reason for that is that we're not shipping in exotic stones from India or China and the fossil fuel and the carbon footprint that that has. This is a couple examples. Uh, uh, these are cemeteries actually at, a, at Royal Oak Burial Park in Victoria, led by Stephen Olson, one of the founders of the Green Burial Movement in Canada, with a wicker casket. Um, in an area that now is probably 10, 15 feet high in Douglas fir and dogwood trees. Um, um, the principle with this particular um, green burial area is that the density of graves is, is expected to be that uh, uh, similar to or, or better than that in the traditional burial area. Uh, you still have to acquire that land, develop it. Uh, why would the density be any less? Um, one of the smaller, this is a small community, Demon Island, BC, natural burial cemetery on a, and within, a, within conservation lands. Um, uh, a, a real opportunity for those of you in, um, in Ontario. Um, so Rebecca, I think we, this poll came up, did it not? Um, so are we good to go on, on this one? Yeah, so the poll has been live for a couple minutes. Um, maybe we'll take a couple seconds if you would like to um, vote on this question and then I can share the response with the audience. Yeah, let's do that. So if you're new to Zoom, there should be a poll button at the bottom where you find the question and answer uh, button as well. Interesting. Looks like 71% of respondents um, said that they have had requests for a green burial section. Mm -hmm. And that number has been sliding steadily upward over the last five or 10 years. Uh, we're still finding within the funeral sector uh, with, with funeral directors within the bereavement sector, um, uh, a fair bit of reticence, uh, I'll be honest. Um, but even there, uh, more interest shown. And so one of the things that those of us that have been advocates for Green Barrel for some time say is, um, if a baker isn't putting rye bread on her shelf, she's not gonna sell rye bread. Um, so in the case of cemeterians, um, it's not that difficult to create a green burial area. Um, 
And so why not give it a go? You don't have to set aside acres and acres, um, but give it a go. And I think you'd be surprised. You'll be really surprised at how the press takes it up because there's something about green and burial that the press uh, falls all over. And so that in itself is worth um, the investment in, um, in a green burial. We can come back to uh, green barrel questions. We're, we're, we're running pretty close to time here. We did want to talk about um, uh, potential burial surge um, arising from the pandemic. Um, and the, the key things that I thought would be appropriate to talk about is that there is already uh, insufficient cemetery land across the globe. Um, in almost every urban area in North America that uh, we work in and many that we don't work in that we're aware of, there is a near crisis in cemetery land and, and burial capacity already, um, even before the pandemic. Um, there's a whole bunch of reasons for that and that's a whole other talk in itself. And <laughs> we, we may just devote a webinar to that, to that topic. Um, but that's part of the concern that many of us have with this pandemic is that it, it really could strain our land and our human resources. Um, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen these slides from Brazil and from, from Hart Island in New York. Um, Hart Island, uh, these are all indigent burials, unfortunately. People that died and no one claimed them. And so, of course, something had to be done. And so Heart Island was used to, uh, on this mass burial basis. Um, now, uh, I, I think that many of you would, would agree that if you had to do um, even a couple dozen more burials in a month, that would strain some of the capacity you have. Um, uh, would it strain uh, your ability to accurately locate all of the available graves? Uh, would it mean that you need to now uh, use unopened roads and other parts of your cemetery that had not been platted out, um, surveyed out for cemeteries? Um, would you have the capacity if you all of a sudden had uh, a dozen uh, burials to do inside of two days? Uh, are your staff trained? Um, what if one of your staff or heaven forbid, more go down with the virus, uh, do you have capacity in your organization to switch gears and potentially bury a more along uh, a mass burial basis such as shown here? Um, so a number of, uh, uh, of you that are actually on the call have uh, talked to me about um, uh, training uh, people, uh, others in the parks department or the engineering department. Uh, digging a grave precisely in the right location without disturbing the graves on either side takes some skill and some practice. Digging a trench, a little less so. Uh, and I think that we'd all agree that it's not likely we're going to go from, from our normal pattern and volume of burials all the way up to uh, a, a, a huge crisis point overnight. So uh, what we're seeing in some of the plans that um, that we read or are developing is a, a, a scaled step-by-step -step incremental ramping up of, um, of the capacity to be able to accommodate um, many more graves. Um, I, I think we could spend some time talking about the load on the morgue system and on um, crematoria uh, across North America. Um, certainly for those that are participating from Africa will know this is, <laughs> this is a long standing problem, uh, uh, especially in uh, the African continent where burial is not a tradition, uh, sorry, uh, cremation is not a tradition and there are very few crematory to start with. So um, to think that crematory, cremation is the, is the solution to disposing of bodies during a pandemic is, is, is not universally um, applicable. One of the things that, um, that, that I've been aware of for years and um, I've talked about off and on, but I, frankly now I realize I should have been talking about much more often is the Scandinavian statutory requirement for cemeteries to have X amount of land set aside in the event of a mass burial. That's what this field is here. It also functions as a, as a large scattering metal. So, um, 
it's doing double duty. And and in fact, one of the 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 ones that I'm I'm most fond of is in Holland, where uh, an area just like this is used to host the summer symphony. So as most of you will well know, and going back to the keystone idea, um, uh, large open spaces can be used for a whole variety of different appropriate activities. But being ready for a pandemic and a, and a mass burial um, with land set aside for this purpose um, uh, hits a, a number of key objectives, some of which uh, 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 we don't have time to go into now, but I think it may, may be obvious to you from um, a long-term um, uh, capacity and expandability, expansion capacity. So with that, I, I you know, we're pretty much on time. We promise we try to be through this in 45 minutes or so. We've, we do have more time for, for some discussion um, or at least um, uh, question and, and answer. So um, what's... Uh, what are the high points there, Rebecca? Well, maybe since we just ended um, on burial surge, I will circle back to that question that I asked you earlier. Um, so this participant is wondering, with such uncertain times, uh, what are specific ways to conduct services in cemeteries? There are some good operating procedures that are out there. Um, and I think that this may be one where I'm happy to volunteer to come back to this group with a canvas of, of those procedures and some links. But uh, from what we're seeing, um, many cemeteries are not allowing uh, people to even get out of their cars. So it's mm -hmm. sadly a drive-by experience. Or uh, families are coming in small cohorts, small groups, and then they go away, another group comes along. And of course, the practice of social distancing um, will be with us for the foreseeable future. I think we would all agree. And so that applies to um, those of us that are actually delivering the service as well, isn't it? Those that are operating the lowering device that are setting up the greens and, and any chairs or other amenities around the grave site, uh, mm -hmm. working with our religious leaders to be sure that everyone um, has what they need to contribute, what they want to contribute in a safe manner. Um, so, uh, uh, as far as the, um, the, what, what I'm hearing from, from many of our, uh, uh, clients and people in the community, many on the line today is that it, it hasn't had a, a significant, um, um, standstill type impact yet. And people are, are using their common sense. Um, certainly in our office, we're looking at how are we going to come back to work? We're, we're doing that in using all of the public health rules that, that all of us use um, in, in the community, but that much more uh, diligent. Um, we have a question about Ontario regulations. So this participant would like to know if Ontario's regulation changes around scattering of cremains in public places have had any significant effects on how people are approaching scattering? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and there's some of that is happening in Alberta as well. Their act is presently under under review um, and um, just a quick aside, it's complicated by um, many new Canadians that they want to scatter in moving water. And so mm -hmm. there's a concern about the environmental impact sedimentation primarily. Um, we have not yet seen in Ontario um, a surge in cremated remains coming to cemeteries yet. But frankly, I think a lot of that has to do with people not really understanding that um, the uh, Bereavement Authority of Ontario and the regulations that are coming out um, discourage um, scattering of cremated remains uh, on lands um, that are non-sanctioned. Mm -hmm. um, so this, is, this um, question is about the do's and don'ts of um, new cemeteries. So they're asking, what are the do's and don'ts that we need to consider um, in the first five to 10 years of cemetery launch? Well, let me assume that that's a, a, a brand new cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, uh, based on our experience in creating brand new cemeteries, the first thing is to uh, get onto it soon, 
Uh, don't wait until you're down to your last two or three years, especially in Ontario, where it can take eight to 10 years to approve a new site. So kind of backing up from the participant's question, don't wait too long. Um, but secondly, plant trees, get the landscape established. People will patronize a cemetery that has a sense of permanence and meaning to it. And a big open grass landscape is generally not going to cut it. Um, so that's number one. Secondly, um, establish the cemetery and maintain it to the highest standard you can within the budgets and time you have available. That, uh, I think most would agree, is the best marketing ever. Um, the sense that people care about how their loved one's grave space, whether that's interment in a, a column area or in the ground, um, mm -hmm. that space will be cared for. Um, and, um, and ensure that the, the families on the, the front of house, the front counter service are dealt with respectfully, that they know of the options um, and that um, they know the records are gonna be managed uh, uh, with the utmost care, their privacy will be cared for, and for municipal cemeteries, that they're, they're here for the long run. They're not going anywhere. They, under most provincial regs, they can't go anywhere. <laughs> um, so I, I think that plan ahead, uh, establish and maintain well and treat the families well. I think if you do those things, as well as other best practices for opening and closing, um, you'll be off and running very, very nicely. Great. Um, we'll just have one more question that I will post to you. Uh, so this participant is wondering if there's much difference, uh, cultural difference, um, between people who support green burials. Is there a, an urban-rural divide that you've seen or any difference between in income or education difference, et cetera? Well, that's a great question and probably one that we should pose in a more um, a rigorous uh, uh, quantitative survey uh, before too long. But my, my intuition is no, it, it's quite a mix. Um, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I, 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 that's my intuition, and I'm not sure I've got enough data to, to really say whether it's um, mostly uh, Canadians and Americans of European descent or whether it's new Canadians. Um, um, that may be one that, that those participating uh, might want to chime in or answer back on. Um, either directly to me or through the chat function, and, and we'll get back to you on that. Um, keeping in mind Green Barrel is still only a small percentage of, the, uh, of, the, of all the interments that happen across North America so far. It's growing, it's definitely not a fad, it's a trend, um, but it's still small. So um, the sample size, if you will, is, is small. And I think there's still a lot of people that don't, they don't know it's an option. And if they did know it was an option, they don't really know really what it is either. So mm -hmm. um, certain locales where Green Barrel has been very successful, successful um, there is, of course, a much higher understanding. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Okay. Great. Maybe we'll end it on that. We're going to leave the uh, webinar open for a few minutes here. So if you have any further questions, feel free to ask them of us. And yeah. Thank you once again. Uh, it's been wonderful to have so many of you participate and show your interest in, in our e-learning opportunities. We need your feedback um, so, uh, so that we can uh, tailor our next, uh, our next webinar to your needs. Um, we will endeavor to uh, get back to you with any questions that were left unanswered today, but on behalf of Rebecca, uh, and the rest of us here at Lees and Associates, uh, thank you so much for participating today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.